This episode of Untold Stories is sponsored by Paraswap. You'll hear more about them later on in this episode. So Gabe here is an eight-year veteran of an 11-year-old industry. He's been around the block, uh, block spaces, actually, and we'll talk about that and why it's important in a few minutes. But I want to give a little bit of a brief history, too, about my story, how I kind of ended up in the Tampa Bay region, because... Most people still think that my wife and I and our family live in New York City, and we don't. We moved down here uh, five or six years ago, all because of this guy. And I'll tell you that story in a second, too, and Rosa, too, your partner in crime, and, and, and how Block Spaces was really just, a, just an idea. But um, back in 2011, at the dawn of the uh, Bitcoin era, I remember sitting in, in my parents' basement, and Bitcoin was really relegated to just some chat rooms, uh, Bitcoin talk forums. It wasn't even called Bitcoin talk. It was just called forums.bitcoin.org. These were the days when Satoshi was yelling at people on the forums, saying things like, if you don't understand, I don't have time to explain it to you. Um, these were the fun days. These were the brotherhood days. These were the days and the sisterhood. These were the days when Bitcoin was so abysmal and everyone laughed at us so much. We were just a bunch of misfits, weirdos, and really kind of like not thinking that anyone would take us seriously ever. But we had each other. And that's really what all that mattered. Because at the end of the day, this was the dawn of a rebuilding of a whole new financial system. And I had the first Bitcoin exchange, one of the first Bitcoin exchanges in, from, that we ran from 2011 to 2013. And it was, those were the years. Those were the years pre-altcoins. It was just about Bitcoin. But it was more about the questions of who, why, this was you know, coming off of 2009, the subprime mortgage crisis. These were crazy years when a lot of people, even back then, didn't really have faith in what the future of the financial system will be. The cracks were starting to be formed uh, in those years. And everything grew and grew and grew. New Bitcoin companies started launching, new blockchains, layer ones, Satoshi disappeared, and this thing grew up. Coinbase launched. Uh, myself and a few other people launched the Bitcoin Foundation in 2013. And at this point, I was 21 years old, 22. Um, I realized that this thing is a lot bigger than myself. And I'm a, I'm a child in an adult world. And things kind of got very big, a little bit too quickly for myself. I made a mistake. And I ended up in serving 18 months in federal prison. And for my involvement in having uh, been instant, and, and, and everything changed. Everything changed because when I got out, in 2016, um, I wasn't sure if I'd have a job. I wasn't sure if this Bitcoin thing would even exist. But who knew that when I got out in 2016, the world would be 10x in Bitcoin and crypto. I hear the news talking about DAOs when I get out. And I realized that New York was no longer a place to me. So I went on the internet and I'd just gotten out. No one really knew that I was out yet. And I wanted to get back into the Bitcoin world. And somehow I heard of this place, Tampa Bay, and I reached out to Gabe. And this was when Gabe was just running the Bitcoin meetup. There was no Tampa Bay Bitcoin community that existed outside of the Tiki bars. And, but this is what, when, so when I spoke to Gabe and I said, can I come down and can I come visit you and, and can I speak to your, to your group? And of course he said yes and Rosa said yes. I fell in love with this region. I fell in love with this place. And we, we bought a one-way ticket. We never went back up to New York. And we've been here for five or six years. And you were right. This place became the hub. And your vision of block spaces has become such a, uh, uh, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? It became what it meant to be, what your vision was. So congratulations. Thank you. No, Charlie, that's amazing <laughs> to hear you say that. And it, it, it was pretty surreal when you reached out to me on Meetup. I got a message. And I'm like, Charlie Shrem, the Charlie Shrem? You're like, yeah, call me. <laughs> and I was like, you, you were just so low-key about it. Um, but, of course, I knew who you were and knew your story and knew what you've gone through. And I told you how much that really meant um, uh, at the time. And that kind of fueled my fire as well. So when we had you out for that special meeting and, and that was like the most packed meeting we had to that date. And there was like 30, 30, 40 people. Right. Yeah. So, um, more people in this room. Yeah, yeah, 
<laughs> exactly. So, um, uh, and I, I don't think any, any uh, those who were there, I don't even know if anybody that's still around went to that meeting. Um, there might be a couple, actually. Uh, but it, it was uh, it was a uh, it was a time to for you. I know getting your feet yeah. uh, back under you after going through what you went through and uh, finding a new new uh, new path. I needed a new fire too because yeah. everything pre that was for me Bitcoin and being part of that financial future. You know, bringing people out of uh, uh, you know f freeing their self sovereignty, being able to to put food on their on on people's plates being able to to do that was why I originally got in but then everything changed and what I saw in that room was people actually being able to take this technology and build the tools to then do a lot of crazy things to be able to to do decentralized finance this was pre defi yeah. this was pre nft this was pre any of that and to be able to have that uh, ability to grow that was such an amazing thing yeah, it really was, and and I think that's uh, what we kind of saw the potential with this technology, right? Uh, but we just didn't know how to get there. So what uh, happened? You met you met Jeff Vinick. You met that this whole group. You you were in you know the arena right here where the lightning play. You you ended up. I remember touring with you, Block Spaces, which was going to be this huge Bitcoin mine in North Tampa. <laughs> you got your you guys got your own space. What's the progression? How did Block Spaces become the technology incubator in the Tampa Bay region? You guys have uh, tons of of companies and people have launched out of it, and then also you guys have launched your company to allow any other businesses that want to incorporate with like sixteen or seventeen different blockchains to work with you guys. Yeah. How did this all come to be? Yeah, so uh, a, a long story, uh, but to shorten it up, um, you know, in in 2017, you know, there was a big hype bubble uh, in the space uh, that we all, I think, remember. Um, at the time, of course, I did pretty well with my Bitcoin investments, so I decided, you know, our, our meetup was growing so fast. Uh, and it, we couldn't hold it at the tiki bar anymore because um, so, there were like hundreds of people coming to this thing. So uh, I said, well, why don't we just get our own dedicated space and host all kinds of educational uh, events uh, covering all the different aspects of, of cryptocurrency and blockchain. So uh, we had like Mining Mondays, Trading Tuesdays, uh, the general meetups on Wednesdays, uh, uh, developer workshops on Thursdays, and then like movie night on Friday. Like every day of the week we had something going on and people were coming. So uh, I knew that there was, there was a, a, a hunger for this kind of information. And um, of course after after the the bubble burst in 2018, uh, that kind of died down. Uh, but there were still a remnant of us that stuck around that were in it for the right reasons. And and those people went on to uh, continue to build the things that are now growing tremendously right now. There's a word that I'm forgetting, but it's like when everyone thinks that you're crazy and you're just stuck in a group of a few. But it's you know diamonds are created under pressure. So if yeah. you know every time you'd have this bear market. Um, you can see that happening. You see some people leave, but those who stay are the diamonds and end up building the companies of tomorrow. You know, you look, Untold Stories was created out of the bear market. Celsius was launched in the bear market. Yeah. Blocks, everything, all of the, and this is like a big lesson that I, that I try to remember people is that, I think Brock Pierce said it best. He's like, he said, bear markets are for building and bull markets are for bullshit or something yeah. like that. <laughs> something I like love that. that quote. Yeah, it, well, it's so true because that's when we, uh, hunkered out and, and had to focus on building something that was going to last. Uh, and so that's when uh, Block Spaces took kind of a, a, a new iteration. Um, uh, after seeing all these uh, other founders and entrepreneurs building uh, applications with the technology, uh, that's when we decided to uh, start kind of doing the same thing, uh, but with a focus on enterprises. Like how are businesses going to transition from this Web 2.0 based world to the Web 3.0 world that's being built with this decentralized technology? Um, and so we found a lot. We talked to a lot of businesses. We saw the challenges. Uh, that are involved from a technology perspective. And so now we're uh, building a platform tool, uh, an, an integration tool that will enable uh, business applications that are legacy business applications be able to uh, transact on Web 3.0 uh, 
this, applications. This Web 3.0 terminology is something that I'm hearing a lot. Uh, you hear it with Metaverse a lot too, kind yep. of going in, you know, Facebook rebranding as Meta made a lot of people open up you know, they're, they're the news apps and try to Google what the hell does the word meta even mean. In Hebrew, it actually means dead because the Hebrew is my first language. Like, she died. I, yeah, that's what, so it's a weird word that they rebranded to. But, I mean, everyone is... I think that's, I think that's ap thank apropos. Thank you guys then. for laughing at that. <laughs> but I... And what's the first... Did you guys actually like that other joke or are you guys laughing too? I wasn't sure. But um, with the Web 3.0 and Metaverse... One of the best definitions that I got just the other day about it was someone said to me, Charlie, I'm not going to invest in something that's attempting to build the Web 3 on the Web 2 rails. Right. What do you what, what do he mean by that? Well, because it's a different, a completely different infrastructure. Right. So um, it's a whole different apparatus that you have to consider when you're dealing with Web 3.0 because it's decentralization. You're dealing with distributed networks uh, and therefore you need uh, different tools and applications to be able to talk to those networks and applications. Everything needs to kind of talk to each other. Yep. Um, and but it's a different language. So there's a there's a translation barrier there, if you will. It, a, a good way to kind of understand this is like, okay, so you had the MP3 file. The MP3 file, and if we look at what an NFT is and look at an MP3 file, an MP3 file is a fungible token, if you will. You can copy and paste it. You can send it to people. You can, you know, we were all, people were hopefully not downloading movies and music, the ones that they should have been, you know, 10 years ago. But that, if we think about fungibility, we think about the ability to copy and paste data. So what a non-fungible token is, if you look at it, right now we, we use it for art and potentially other things that we really understand why there needs to be a digital uniqueness. But really, if you can take that MP3 and you can say, Gabe, you, know, Gabe, you own this. You, you, know, you compose this MP3 in your basement. You, this is your music. And now, if this music exists on the internet, or the Web 3.0 as we know it, instead of just the reference to that data be ownership of you, instead of that MP3 file being able to be copy and paste to copy and paste, but everyone knows that you own it and hopefully you're getting commercial attribution for it, in the Web 3, that same MP3 file will have data built into it. It'll have an NFT. It'll be an NFT. So no matter where that data sits anywhere on the Internet, you get commercial, personal, any attribution. And this is not just with music, it's with everything, and everything is gonna talk to each other. Yeah, and we see a lot of brands uh, starting to grasp that I idea, and it, it really solves a big problem with uh, counterfeiting, right? Um, there's uh, lots of knockoff items for luxury goods, for instance, uh, of course, media files. Uh, uh, this technology is the, going to be the foundation of a whole new architecture infrastructure that will uh, mitigate against those kinds of fraudulent activities. So uh, that's what we're building for. That's what we're building towards, a more transparent, equitable world uh, using a technology that's secure and immutable and can't be, can't be hacked or forged or manipulated in any way. Sorry to interrupt your regularly scheduled programming, but I wanted to tell you guys that if you're using PancakeSwap, Uniswap, DYDX, SushiSwap, you're doing it wrong. You need to be using PowerSwap because PowerSwap is a user interface, a decentralized smart contract platform that sits on top of all of these. And when you go to PowerSwap or untoldstories.link forward slash PowerSwap because they're refunding your gas, if you go there, then you'll be able to, on top of Ethereum, Binance Smart Chain and Polygon look for the best prices for your tokens and swap and do everything in one predefined transaction on chain. Instead of having to do the approval to this token, to that token, to do all these different things, Paraswap does it all for you. It's decentralized. They just released their API version five that you can see everything. It's all open source. Very cool stuff. Untoldstories.link forward slash Paraswap. If you're using any of the other decentralized protocols, you're doing it wrong because you need to be using the routing, beautiful Paraswap routing system, and it's fully decentralized too. It's gorgeous. I'll talk to you guys soon. And when you're building on top of this technology, it like de-risks the risk. You know, you hedge 
when you're building technology that's decentralized when it comes to finances or data, when you have the, the technical inability to have a back door, that takes a lot of risk. So now you don't have to prove that you care about privacy because it's yeah. inherently into the system. It builds in from the ground up. Yeah. It, it really is such a beautiful thing. So you have a lot of listeners uh, here, here in the crowd. Um, we have a, a lot of listeners that are listening and everything like that. And they kind of fall into a lot of categories. But, but generally, I've, after speaking to a lot of people, it comes down to people who are either working in legacy, you know, legacy jobs, as I call it, and they want to jump into our space, those sure. who are building their startups now from scratch, or those who are investors and things like that. Um, what type of red flags or common denominators, if you will, would you, would you, or advice that you would have for some of these people that are investing in building? What type of things are, are can you talk about some of the things that, that you guys are building in block spaces too? Yeah, um, so uh, there's a lot there. So um, for the, for the you know, regular person just getting in, you know, start with Bitcoin. <laughs> you got to trust the thing that is the longest standing, yes. uh, uh, most trusted cryptocurrency. There's lots of new ones that claim to do magical things. Um, and, and some of them might work. Most of them will not. Uh, so start with the one that is winning. Uh, that's what I would say, first of all. Uh, second of all is um, like some of the things that we're building towards is uh, different use case applications uh, or uh, applying the blockchain for different use case applications uh, within business uh, settings or industry settings. Um, so and that varies the spectrum of, of uh, some of the things that we're seeing and talking with our companies that are they, they want to uh, have a more robust uh, supply chain management system, for instance. We're seeing, uh, since COVID, uh, the disruption and how fragile our supply chain systems actually it's were. It's really crazy. Yeah, it's, it's insane. I mean, we're in the 21st century, and we can't ship things because of uh, the disparate systems all speaking uh, different languages or, or not a being able to. siloed information. The siloed information is causing so much friction that we can't transact. Um, blockchain solves all that. Blockchain transactions solve all that. Um, so putting all these things on it, but the, the problem is how do you get everybody on the same ledger system? That's the, that's the problem. And that becomes a technical problem. And that's what we saw with block spaces is how can we solve that underlying infrastructure problem with an easy to use application for businesses that don't want to, de they don't want to hear about blockchain. They don't understand the technology. Uh, and now they don't have to, they could just plug into our platform and have that kind of robust, uh, secure, immutable uh, ledger transactability without having to adopt uh, a whole new technology stack. How is how is working in this space made you more self-aware? Okay, so that's a big question because that's that's what I love about this is it 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 it, it changes your yes. way of thinking. It goes deeper than just oh, I can make a bunch of money. No. That's not what we're here for. We're here, like Nuke said uh, earlier, we're, we're not here for a number go up, number go down. Um, if, you're, if, if you are here for that, then you know, Godspeed, you're probably going to get wrecked. Uh, what we're here uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so true. What we're here for is to change fundamentally how things are, are working. And we know that things are inequitable. We know that the banking system is fraudulent and uh, it, it, there's malinvestment and uh, all, all kinds of corruption happening. This fundamentally changes that. And we can change it from the ground up and we can change it for the, the, those that are in most need first, which is the opposite of what's happening uh, in, in our traditional financial systems. So um, uh, that, that's what we want to do. We want to get to the underlying problem and fix it there. Uh, but that starts to ask deeper questions like, okay, well, how do I value my own time, right? Like, what am I doing with my time and how is that being used and who's, who has control of that? Right when you are working for a paycheck, and uh, but the central bank is printing more money, that dilutes your actual time, your worth, your self worth and value yeah. is being diluted and stolen from uh, every time they print more cash. And guess what? They printed a lot this year. Twenty five percent. Twenty five percent. That's like in the past few years, 
our currency has been debased by 25%. That's yeah. the number. So if anyone expects inflation to not... I mean, what happens is our workforce, everything has to catch up as quickly, but we know from history, it doesn't happen that way. Yeah, no, it, it can't. It can't. It fundamentally can't. If you understand the economics of it, it's not, it's not possible. Yeah, I've, I've tried to becoming more self-aware too, and I try to not think in, in like large group mentality. So yeah. I always try to like say to myself, where am I wrong with? And so I agree with, with everything you've said. And I think money is actually something that's baked into our DNA, like how spiders can, you know, weave webs as soon as they're born. It's like baked into their DNA. I don't even know if that's true. And I'm going to have someone who's like a, a spider doctor come over and be like, you're wrong, man. <laughs> but the, the point is, is that we all have this want or belief that the value that we create for the world, the pro-socialness that we exude, that the love that we come out with, the, the work that we do to make the society better should be stored in some sort of like value battery. Totally. And yeah. the dollar is that for years, that dollar, but when, and, or, and it could be any financial, it could be it, any it, instrument. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, you have to have a mutual agreement within that exactly. community that that is valuable for everybody. Right. And that's a medium. That's what a medium of exchange actually means. Right. Uh, but you also have to have something that stores the value. So that's, that can last over time. So it has to transcend time. Uh, over long periods of time, that value is stored, that energy that somebody worked for to create, that other people value, stored in something. Um, and so that's what typically, you know, we, we know gold has been that for a couple millennia. Uh, the dollar kind of uh, was like the second layer for gold, if you will. But now we see how that's being corrupted. That's a good way to look at it. The dollar has been kind of until like the late 70s was like a layer two of gold. Yeah, of course. It's like a side yeah. chain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that's a layer two <laughs> side chain. Uh, but it, but the, the, the federation wasn't distributed enough. So it's totally centralized, as we know. And they, it's been corrupted. So uh, we have to move to something else. And we know gold failed, uh, unfortunately, uh, even though I still recommend buying gold. Uh, but yeah. we need something that can't fail, that it's, it's not even possible to fail. Even with human uh, corruption, it's incapable of failing. And that's why Bitcoin matters. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. And you know what's going to happen, though? You have to understand too, you know, you have governors of federal, of, of the federal reserve of various federal reserve banks, probably the one in Atlanta that all they're, they're holding Bitcoin. Their kids are holding, but we're, we're converting people to Bitcoiners. So what's happening is I think the dollar is actually going to become more competitive because the dollar now is going to be seen as a competition with Bitcoin and Bitcoin is going to have to get more competitive. You have these two competing, but that's not a bad thing for people like us. Competition is better for all of us. So this is a good thing. We're in the dawn of a new era where you have competition and you have the ability for it to be an equal playing field. Anyone anywhere in the world now doesn't need permission to access this whole world that we're in. Yeah, no, and, and that's what's incredible about this. And that's, uh, that's why we're pushing forward to help enable that, uh, that eventuality to come. Come faster, right? We need it. We need it. We need it now. We needed it yesterday, uh, but we need to make it happen. And I, I hope that's why everybody else is here or, or starts recognizing why this is important uh, for our uh, community here locally, for our families, for our future. Uh, this is why we have to change things now. I, I agree. I can't. I can't agree more. Florida. I call it. I call it the free state of Florida. That's what I call it in my dreams. Governor DeSantis, I, I love you, boy. Like, I, I mean, I know president hopefully soon. And people understand that. What is it about Floridians? What is it about this state, about the Constitution? Because you grew up here. I didn't. Hmm. Uh, what is it about this place that the Wild West of the crypto industry and the wanting to make your family, you know, like make your family better? you know, and grow. We all have a right to be in a better place, a yeah. uh, victory. What is it about this place? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Cause I always, 
I always loved growing up here. Uh, it's like paradise, right? We're surrounded by water. God's country. Yeah. So uh, you, can, you can have access to all the things in a big city, but still have uh, lots of amenities uh, that you can take advantage of. But um, I, I don't know, because we're awesome. That's why. I think one of the- Tampa Bay. One of the best things, one of the, I, I, we care about sunset here and like we care about living in the moment. And that's a very important thing because we get too caught up in the future, having these talks, we're excited, but we get too caught up in tomorrow. We get too caught up in tomorrow. We get too caught up in, 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 in years from now, but we forget about the now. You never know. When something could happen, God forbid, you never know if you could be arrested randomly or something, you know, hit by a car, whatever, anything. We need to live in the now. And living in Florida has really taught me to live in the now. You know, let's go find a sunset. Let's go just enjoy the beach. Let's go for a walk with our dogs, things like that. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to move down here. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you.